Okay, so uh, I'm Nathan Hamblin, and I'm co-founder of the Unfiltered Project, along with Doug Tangren, who's sitting here in front. Uh, and uh, why is this pipe bursting? Well, uh, the main reason is because everybody on Earth is getting onto the internet. Uh, the internet is still growing rapidly in population, and the people that are on the internet are using are more and more active. So they're doing more different kinds of things. And another thing that jumps out at me about this graph is that in the United States and countries like it, we already reached our plateau in the user population of the internet some years ago, but the internet's still growing. All the growth is coming from different places and different people. So if you think the internet is converging on a single kind of website or people doing the same kind of thing, it's really not happening. It's diverging in the other direction because each new user is more and more different from the last one. It's reaching a different population of people. The internet is, uh, is getting increasingly diverse. But even if you're looking at that slice of the internet, like the apple pie slice of it that represents Americans doing American things, uh, even, even there, we're not converging in the way that sometimes it seems like we are onto a single, onto a single website or a single platform. Every time it seems like everybody's you know, huddling into the same, to the same thing, like AOL or Facebook, then uh, you find a, a, some new upstart comes in and shakes things up. So, if you don't know what it means to put a pen on something, just ask someone of the opposite gender and she will tell you all about it. But this is just a website uh, called Pinterest that is like uh, right, in, right in Facebook territory and just like taking on users, taking on user activity, people are sharing things with it. And it's right there on the uh, wild, uh, wild web, even though uh, we think of those kinds of users as maybe uh, less sophisticated internet users that would be happier if they were just on uh, some controlled site. In fact, they keep going to different kinds of sites. So um, I found this chart on, uh, on Oracle's servers, even though it's ancient. Uh, this, is, this is the uh, J2E ar architecture. And uh, something I noticed about uh, prescribed application architectures is that as they get older, they become universally despised. But um, there's, a, there's sort of like a honeymoon period where, where they're new and they're, they're kind of OK. And, and before they're even built, they're always going to be the best thing ever. Um, but it just, you know, you have this cycle of uh, love and then disappointment that happens at the end. And, and that's kind of sad uh, that that happens to application <laughs> architectures. Um, so this is, uh, this is what the unfiltered application architecture looks like. Uh, we call it UWA for short. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the video except for the blue tent. Uh, it is, uh, there, there is, we aren't, Unfiltered doesn't tell you how to build your application because you know better than Unfiltered does how to build your application. You're inventing something new. Uh, I don't even know what you're doing. I might not even understand it if I did know. So the, the idea is that uh, the, the Unfiltered gives you an interface to build for the web but what you do behind that interface is totally your business, and, and we're not going to tell you what's the best way to do it, because there's no possible way that we can know that. Uh, and apparently this is resonating with some people. Uh, I just pulled this off the unfiltered listserv uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, saying that uh, the main strength of the fr framework is what it doesn't do. So the idea that unfiltered is not going out and putting its fingers in all different kinds of parts of your application is, uh, has been valuable to some people. Uh, so if Unfiltered doesn't tell you how to build your application and it doesn't keep your hair out of your ramen noodles, then what exactly does it do? What, what, is, the frame, like, what is the toolkit good for? It, it just does HTTP. That's its full aspiration for what it wants to do for you. It just wants to help you with HTTP and putting your application, exposing it to the internet so that people can do things with it. Um, so we call that Unfiltered. Uh, being a toolkit for servicing HTTP requests in Scala. That's its mission. Uh, so how, what exactly does that mean for, uh, what exactly does that mean? Uh, in the first, in the initial build, and, in, and still importantly, that meant that you were building servlet filters uh, with unfiltered. And servlet filters are a great way to build for the web on the JVM. Uh, and, you know, as much as we can, like, laugh about J2EE and, and other uh, big architectures, servlet filters is, is, is itself a pretty, a pretty uh, basic and uh, modest design for, for how you can do that kind of interaction. It's just that it's 
for Java, right? So we wanted a way to create these kinds of filters in Scala. Uh, and uh, the, the original motivation was to get onto App Engine, which uses the filter interface uh, and follows that decently well. It doesn't really conform to a lot of other ideas in Java, and it doesn't let you bring along your own database and stuff like that. So if you want to build for App Engine, you want to you want something that allows you to build filters really well, and then you can use the App Engine stuff that's in Java. Uh, so whereas if you're using a large framework that has its own ideas about the full stack of what you should be doing, then that framework is going to have to port, be ported uh, to, to App Engine in order to get the rest of the stack on there. And then by the time they're done with that, Google's going to change the pricing model, and nobody's going to want to be on App Engine anymore, and then you've wasted your time. So it's better just to write straight for the, write straight for the spec in that case, because then you, uh, then you can just write only the application that you need to write. Uh, so here's an example of uh, making a filter in Unfiltered. Uh, so the echo class the, that we made also implements the, the filter interface. You don't see that, but it is just the same as a filter that you might make in Java. And all it's doing is uh, taking the path that you uh, requested and responding with it. So it's just a very dumb echo filter. Uh, so how would you use this in, in, uh, in your servlet container? The exact same way you'd use a Java filter. You just throw it in there in the web XML and, uh, and it will work. So what if you're uh, writing an application and you don't have a servlet container and you don't really care if you have a servlet container or not because you're not, you're not doing that kind of stuff. You just want to put something on the web. Well, fortunately, the Jetty project has been doing this for a long time, uh, embedding a server for you uh, inside your application so that you can write servlets and filters and then just start them up uh, from within the app. So Unfiltered just gives you an interface to Jetty so that you can do that in very little code. So here we're just doing this, the same configuration that was in the last slide. Uh, we're just starting up a server with our echo filter and running it. Um, but then you start to think, well, if I don't want to, if I'm not tied to the uh, servlet uh, container paradigm, then then do I need to use it at all? Well, no, you don't need to necessarily. So if you want to use a server like Netty, uh, you can use that with unfiltered as well, using the same vocabulary and, and the same uh, path matchers and the same response functions as you would use to build up a filter. You can use to make a Netty handler. Um, so this was a, a pretty straightforward conversion um, that was initiated by DAG, uh, who I think is in the other talk. Uh, so uh, it works the same way. You create a, you create a handler, and then you, you give it to Netty and, uh, and start it up. Now, the thing is, uh, if, you're, if, you're using, if you're using Netty, you aren't usually building exactly the same kinds of apps that you would uh, if you were writing a filter, you want to do something that exploits uh, the, the raw networking uh, capability that you get from Netty. So Unfiltered has no opinion at all about what you do with that stuff. Uh, it just gives it to you in a type safe way. So if you have a request that comes in for some magic path, then you can just take out the underlying context request and event, uh, which are Netty uh, typed objects, and uh, do whatever you want with them. And uh, I don't know what you're going to do. And uh, I'm, you know, you can do. It doesn't really matter as far as unfiltered is concerned. Uh, you might want to respond at some point. Otherwise, the connection will just be left open forever. But I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Like that's up to you. Um, but the neat thing is that even though you have all that access to the the raw functionality of Netty, you still have your vocabulary for responding to requests with the unfiltered objects that you already know from, from working with other things. So you can handle the boring parts of your application uh, and, and, and a tiny little bit of code. And then you can get into the nitty gritty uh, you know, with the same stuff around it, but, but working with the underlying library. So why, why, um, <clears throat> why bother with a small framework? Like, What's the, what's the real motivation to, to use something like this? Is it just so that I can put up a slide with a full web server on it? Uh, is, is it just like deckware, I think they call it? Um, no, uh, it's actually got a lot of uses. Uh, one of them I just uh, took advantage of a couple weeks ago. Um, 
you don't have to be able to read this code. It's just to show you how much there is. Um, when I was uh, rewriting the Posturous SBT plugin to be used as, a, as an independent application, uh, since I have unfiltered now, I was like, oh, well, why don't I just use unfiltered to make it a little bit better? So the way things worked before is if you wanted to, well, first of all, what the plugin does is uh, publishes your release notes too implicitly if you're writing Scala projects. So um, before you do that, you probably want to make sure you didn't make any mistakes and preview them. So it would uh, copy, convert them from Markdown to HTML and then open a web browser on the output files. And then if you realize, oh yeah, I did say something stupid, then you can just edit it and then uh, run the, the task again to copy them and, and then refresh your browser. So better than that, you can just start up a server now and every time you request from it, it, it gives you the, the preview based off of the source markdown files. So it's a, it's a minor uh, improvement that I was just able to drop in um, and I only was able to do it because it's just a couple lines of unfiltered. So like this part, this is the whole preview part of the app and it's 43 lines of code and a lot of it is just the HTML that's wrapping around the preview. Uh, another cool thing you can do uh, with a, a modest toolkit like this is you can just build a filter and put it into the uh, servlet container or whatever, whatever architecture you have that if it involves servlet containers, you can just make a filter that does something in Scala because you want to do it in Scala and, and slide it right in there without maybe, you know, everybody knowing about it. Um, so, and it, oh yeah, you really can't see that. But right there it says unfiltered. So, you know, right between your JSPs and Java servlets, like, you know, it's in there, it's doing something smart, and nobody's quite sure what, except for the Scala programmers, they know about it. Um, but you, you, can, you can just make a filter, right? Um, and one final use case, uh, this is like a chart that's going like, whoa. Um, but uh, if, uh, because you can so easily build different kinds of servers, including uh, uh, servers using new I.O., uh, you can prototype things really easily. So, for example, if, if you have a service that's running in uh, a servlet container and you think it might actually be a lot faster on an NIO server, you can just bang out a prototype in half an hour and then benchmark it and see if, if your guess is right. And, um, in this example, the guest was right, so we went ahead and, and built out the rest of the server, which took another couple days, and, uh, and then saw vastly better improvement just because new I.O. can be better than old I.O. sometimes. Um, so um, unfiltered, it, it turns out that it didn't invent this idea that um, small tools that do one thing well are really good. Uh, and I can't say that it was inspired by uh, program design in the Unix environment because I didn't read that until last week when uh, Doug emailed it to me because um, he was like, this will be really good for your talk. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's awesome paper. Um, but uh, yeah, so the, the idea has actually been around for a long time, right? That, that you have a tool that's focused on one task and it's going to be honed to doing that task well. And then somebody down the line is going to do really amazing things by putting together your smaller tools and into whatever it is that they've conceived of building. But uh, sometimes, sometimes users just want features, right? They don't want to be told that it's super easy to build this thing on their own. Uh, they actually want you to, to help them do the thing they need to do. So we came up with this uh, idea, which is anybody could come up with it to build on top of unfiltered, but just to build kits that are for particular features that you want to have in your application. Um, and the way they work is they, kits are able to look at the incoming request and they're able to affect the response. Not by doing anything uh, magical, but just by using the, uh, the request, uh, the pattern matching that's already in place and the response functions that are already in place. They just wrap around that uh, and, uh, and make it work in a particular way. So the first, the first kit that we made uh, was to have uh, gzip encoded responses in your web server, something a lot of people quite reasonably want to do. So at first we were like, well, we'll just give you uh, a matcher that will only match if the client says they accept gzip, and then you can respond with a, a header to say, oh, this is going to be gzip encoded, and then you can encode it that, you know, you can put a 
filter in front of your response to, to compress everything, and then you can respond. That seems all right, but it's not super easy for the, uh, the application to, to factor out that logic. Uh, in fact, if the application wants to factor it out really well, it needs to build something like a kit. So that's what we did. And uh, now that there's a, a gzip kit, you can just wrap that around uh, the function that handles all your requests normally. So you don't really have to change anything because you already had your function, which we call an intent. Um, <coughs> you, just, uh, you just wrap it in this kit, which is going to do some smart stuff before it calls your function and, uh, and, and handle a response uh, and compress the response if it's appropriate. Uh, even so, and uh, importantly, the, uh, the raw materials for doing that work are still there and unfiltered. The thing we built the kit with is right there available for you to use in a straightforward way. So uh, maybe you have a service that serves gigantic text files and you simply refuse to serve them unless the client accepts gzip. Um, that's fine. Uh, you can just match against that header and if the client doesn't say they accept gzip, then you can return and say, sorry, too bad for you. Um, we're not going to serve this content in a hugely inefficient way. Um, so that's not, you know, that's not built in into unfiltered, but if that's how you want to respond to the request, that's, that's your business. Uh, another thing that, that we came across uh, from user feedback, uh, what you're looking at here is uh, the general way to match paths in unfiltered. Uh, we use pattern matching, uh, and if you're if you're a Scala person, then then you might like it because uh, you can just say, well, if I have a path which has a segment uh, of users, then do this, or if one that has users and then something else, then do that, and and we you know we can read that and we know how extractors work and and that's great, but um, there's one uh, one uh, practical problem with this approach is. It doesn't take very long to hit the maximum size of a, of a method uh, in the JVM if you're doing uh, large partial functions in this way. So if you have an application that has a lot of different paths in it, uh, you're going to hit that limit, and you're going to have to start breaking them apart arbitrarily just in order to satisfy the, the compiler. So that sucks. And, and the other thing is that like you know, people who aren't Scala people look at something like this and they're like, what the hell are you doing? Like, what is that? I don't know. Um, so if you want people to be able to look at your app and just see which path is going where and, and, and what methods are handling it, then that's totally great. You can just use the uh, routes kit, and, uh, which has a couple different versions, uh, to, to do that in, in a way that's probably a lot more readable to the average person. Um, so. This, again, didn't require any changes to the foundation of unfiltered. Uh, it's just another way of creating that partial function that's going to handle the request. So uh, the routes kit uses the uh, familiar rail style uh, path uh, specification. Uh, so same kind of thing we were doing in the last slide. Uh, users go to the user index page. Um, Users uh, that have an ID after that go to the ID page. And the way that it's um, the way that it's handled is all these uh, users index, users get, places index, places get. They all have to have the same. Uh, they all have to take the same parameters of the same type, uh, so that we can call them statically uh, based on based on the incoming path and whether or not it matches the path that you gave to the specify function. So in this case, uh, specify once functions that take a request and a map, which is going to be a map of the uh, keys and the path strings to the values that were found in the request if it matched. So you can actually, you can assume that in this case the ID key is going to be in your map because we're not going to call your method unless it was present just because of the way that's written. Um, so it's a, it's a generic way of delegating processing to somewhere else in your application. Um, but you can continue to use the request that gets passed to it to, uh, to extract parameters that might have been there. If you care about which HTTP method was used, you can use that. So the user's object is not isolated from the web. It's just a, a, a little bit lower of a level behind uh, some routing. 
so this is a, just to flesh out an example uh, of the, the user's uh, get handling, handling getting a specific user, we can say, uh, you, we can use a for expression to say, well, if, if there is an ID in the PMAP, which we know there will be because we wrote the path mapping that way, but if there is an ID in, in the PMAP and there is a user that corresponds to that ID, then we'll yield, uh, we'll yield a response function. But here we're seeing uh, another, another helper that Unfilter gives you, which is a response function for Scalet templates. So if you're using Scalet and you have it on your class path, then you can use this uh, builder for responding to requests uh, with Scalet templates. So here we'll just say there's a user profile SSP and we're going to uh, give it a user, the user object that we retrieved with uh, keyed by the word user. Um, and if, if none of that, if, if that didn't work out so well, then we're just gonna pass on the request. So what pass usually means, if nothing else handles it, then it's gonna end up with some 404 handler, which probably makes sense if they gave a bad user ID, but you could also do something totally different if you felt like it. Uh, so to, to sum up, uh, Senator uh, and uh, Felons had Stevens once referred to the internet as a series of tubes. And uh, we all giggled when he said that um, for a couple of reasons, but one of them is just that the internet is not that organized. The internet is not that clean. It's not this like, uh, you know, cylinders next to each other extending forever and from here to there and taking your data from, you know, the big phone company back to you. Like, we're not just, we're not that organized. We, we are more, the internet, which we're all part of, is more like a system of dirty old pipes. And they've been put together by a lot of different people at different times, extending them in different ways. And, um, you know, whether or not uh, it's always the best way, it is always the way that somehow gives some user something that they wanted somewhere. So uh, if you think about how a plumber might deal with uh, walking into a room <laughs> with a set of pipes like this, he, he's, he's not bringing with him his idealized, uh, you know, what should all pipes everywhere look like, and I'm just gonna replace this with that because you know, nobody can afford to do that. He's gonna find a way to integrate with what's there and add his like hot water heater or whatever he's working on. Uh, using using the, the different tools that are needed for exactly that task. So unfiltered is the same uh, same mindset of we're gonna we're gonna give you what you need to integrate with the larger system that you're a part of, whether that is a, a six month old application or a six year old application, or if that larger system and it always is if that larger system is the web itself that you want to integrate with, uh, then the most important thing is that you have tools that will allow you to do your super smart secret great idea with and, and integrate uh, well and cleanly and truly with the the web itself, which means integrating via HTTP. It's it's the it's the one thing that you can count on, and uh, that's why Unfiltered is is purely and, and solely focused on serving that need. Uh, so that's uh, that's all I have for the talk. Uh, we can go into questions, or I can show you a little bit about how to uh, how to create an app with Unfiltered. Um, if you have a question, raise your hand. Otherwise, I'm okay. The yeah. So the question is, how do you compose the kits together? Uh, the return type of the kits is. Uh, is itself a partial function, and it's the same typed partial function that's going into the kit. So you can wrap multiple of these together, assuming the kit follows that convention. So it, you know, it's all based on whether or not the types do what you want. But the gzip kit works that way, and um, and and that's that's the that's the ideal way for it to work, so that you can just nest them that way. Uh, so the question is uh, the rack middleware, um, which I'm not sure I'll explain the right way, <laughs> but um, are, are we heading in that direction of being able to configure stacks of things like kits that allow you to assemble an application that way? And um, it's, it's funny because even before we started working on Unfiltered, we were talking a lot about how would we do something like rack in Scala. 
And I couldn't come up with a good way to do it because it all, the way that that is built, it's all dynamic and it's all based on putting things you know, into the request and putting state in and, and doing stuff with it later. And I basically, you know, I, I wasn't going to be on the project to recreate Rack on Scala. Um, and then we spent, you know, a year or two with Unfiltered. And when we started getting into kits, we started solving the same kinds of problems, I think, that people use Rack for. So, you know, we're insisting on static typing for everything. So I think it's a little bit harder. It's also a little bit more stable. Uh, as, as far as where, if it's heading that way, uh, that really depends on uh, community contributions because uh, we're, we're so solidly focused on making it do HTTP well that uh, we've built, all the kits that have been built so far have been in response to users asking for a particular feature and they say, oh, it's too hard to do it with, with, you know, without some help from something. So we built it. Um, but yeah, I, in, my, in my mind, uh, since the kits can be built outside of Unfiltered, I like to see people making them outside unfiltered, and then if they look good, we'll just bring them in. And um, so, yeah, it, I, that is that is a direction that we seem to be naturally moving. Uh, any more questions? Okay, thank you for your attention.